Good people of the Grove. It's growth group time. I got to make this a quick short video because there are 71 verses in Luke 22. That's a lot. That's a lot of material to cover. So let me get straight to it. First, a little a preview that I do every time, right? Growth groups are designed not just to understand material. It's not the point of growth groups. Uh, growth groups are designed to, to hopefully equip you with the tools to go and understand the material on your own. You and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, helping you out. And then coming back to your group after you've attempted to obey the scriptures. And so we base our growth group time around three questions. What does this say about God? What does this say about me? And then what must I do as a result? You are supposed to, in an ideal world, going on your own to answer those questions and then coming back after you have tried to obey the scriptures according to what you have seen and what God himself has told you to do. So with those uh, boundaries in mind around what a growth group is truly all about, let me get to Luke 22. Here we go, right? So Luke 22, really long, uh, the end of Jesus' life where we see the disciples uh, being fickle, as we all are, and where I think the narrative really pulls out for us some things that we can be aware of as we look at the passage. So let's look at it together and let's look at those three questions. What does this say about God? What does this reveal about me or humans? And then what must I do if these things are true? So uh, what does this say about God, right? Uh, ultimately, I think there's one thing that's said, and I think it's said all, all throughout scriptures, uh, the scriptures, and that is this, like God is mighty, right? Um, and I just kind of see that it, 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 Jesus puts a paradigm out for those that would be great in the kingdom of heaven and those that are going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Those that are be great in the kingdom of heaven, I think Jesus is putting before us that he is the greatest. Um, and how is it that he shows that he is the greatest. Well, throughout this passage, there are about four things that I noted. There are many more, of course. Four things that I noted where um, he shows that he's the greatest. Number one, he serves his disciples. He serves them communion. He serves them in his prayers. He serves them in telling them the kind of death that they will have. Uh, that's a, what, a, what a good friend would do. He serves them uh, throughout. So he serves his disciples. That's how he shows that he's the greatest. In fact, that's what he, the paradigm he uses in the middle of the chapter is those who will be the greatest will become the least by serving. And he serves his disciples well. He assigns, their, something I've never seen in this passage until today. He assigns the disciples their places in the kingdom. Verse 29 and 30 say this, right now there were seven brothers. Uh-oh, that's the wrong passage. Hello, let me get to the right place. Uh, 29 and 30. And I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom, in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus himself assigns the position of, uh, of judge for those apostles, but also for the kingdom for people. That's comforting to me. It also could be scary for others. He assigns their uh, position. Um, he healed Malchus. That's how he shows that he's the greatest when he puts the uh, the ear back on Malchus. Malchus is not named here, but we know from the other, I believe it's John, uh, that names Malchus there in the garden scene. And he, of course, foresees Peter's death uh, just before that in verses 31 through 34. So Jesus is the greatest. That's what we see about God. Now, the thing about that that's interesting is that the narrative is showing you or trying to kind of lure you into this trap, so to speak, that he's not great. Everybody else around him does not see him as great. They're going to kill him. They're going to eventually put him to death. Uh, but the narrative and, and, and the things that are being revealed about Jesus that don't let looks deceive you. He is the greatest in the kingdom um, by, by all those things, right? Okay, so what does this reveal about me or humanity. Well, I think one, the first thing that's revealed right off the bat in the first six verses, we want to kill the things we don't understand. We certainly are afraid of things we don't understand, but then the, the Bible pulls it one step further by saying, we're not just afraid of things we don't understand. We want to kill the things that we don't understand and therefore fear. That's what they do with Jesus. They don't understand him. They're afraid of him and they want to kill him. They want to silence him. We do that in our own lives. In, in places uh, or in things that we don't understand, maybe politically, we villainize, we demonize, we therefore kill it in some ways. 
Um, people we don't understand or people we don't like, or maybe we don't like because we don't take the time to understand them. We vilify them, we kill them, we push them out relationally. We do this all the time. Um, we are self-absorbed. <laughs> oh, that's always fun to say. We are self-absorbed, right? Uh, when Jesus is talking about his death, when he is basically saying, you know, I'm about to be betrayed, uh, the very next line is, in verse 24, a dispute also arose amongst them as to which of them would be the greatest in the kingdom. Man, we are a self-absorbed people. And when God is trying to impart great wisdom on us, we usually are thinking about our lunch plans. Uh, when he is inviting us into deeper waters, uh, we are thinking, well, that's probably going to cost me a little too much. I'd like to be greater than that. We are self-absorbed people. We all, all are also like Peter saying one thing and then doing another. That's called hypocrisy. We are all full of hypocrisy. The church is full of hypocrisy. Uh, we are much like Peter. We say one thing, Lord, I'll never betray you. I'm going to go to death for you. And then just a few hours later, uh, a little village girl, servant girl, scares us into lying and disowning uh, the Savior that we do indeed love. Finally, I think we jump to conclusions. Uh, now this one is I could sit and talk for hours on. Uh, but in verse 71, the Pharisees jumped to conclusions, right? And they're ready to, to kill Jesus there at the end of the chapter. The reason why they're ready to kill Jesus at the end of the chapter is because they have preconceived notions uh, of what they expect to happen. And then they let those preconceived notions determine the truth or what their, their view of the truth. Instead of going into a situation with eyes wide open that they don't exactly know what's going on, they go into a situation uh, assuming the end before the beginning even starts. Man, we do that. We do that in every sort of situation. We assume things about people and we don't ever usually give them a chance. We assume things about God. Instead of giving God's word the chance to speak to us and give us uh, truly the words of life, we usually short circuit that process by the lenses we wear called assumption and preference. And um, if we're not careful, we will push the true Jesus out of our lives if we go into a relationship with him with preconceived notions and assumptions. A lot to be said about that, but I think it's true there in the scriptures. All right, now what must we do as a result? Well, uh, in the middle of the passage, Jesus says, hey, remember in the beginning of, your, of the ministry that I put before you, I told you not to take a knapsack. I told you not to take provisions. I told you not to take a sword. Well, times are coming when it's time to pick up that sword, that knapsack, and those provisions. Not a literal sword, most people don't think. Most people think, uh, what they're saying is the season is changing and we need to adjust to spiritual seasons as well. Jesus was trying to instead prepare his disciples for a season of conflict that was about to be upon them. And so when they say, oh, we have two swords, he's not going, oh yeah, that'll do. He's going, enough about the swords. That's enough. That's how I interpret the passage. But I think the thing there for us is um, what must I do in this is we need to be ready to adjust to spiritual seasons. There are seasons to enjoy uh, still waters with Jesus. But there's also seasons to pick up our arms and fight against the spiritual matters that are coming against us. And I think Jesus is inviting his disciples, therefore you and me, to discern the seasons and act appropriately. We don't need to be carrying a sword around all the time, but we need to probably arm up more than we think uh, against the spiritual uh, forces that are coming against us. Now, that's number one. Number two, um, this is kind of a principle, but I'll, I'll put it into a, an I will statement, I suppose. A lack of prayer will lead to temptation. A lack of prayer will lead to temptation. Verses 39 through 40, 46, excuse me. Um, therefore, pray, right? Therefore, pray. Like enough with the flesh being willing. Like the flesh is, is it wants to, it, it's going to convince us it's inconvenient and therefore a lot of work and then therefore don't do it. Or it's impractical when it comes to prayer. I mean, pray, let us pray, let us be a praying people. If we find ourselves being tempted, we probably are lacking in prayer. The final thing in this apparently longer video than I'd hoped, 10 minutes almost, I'm gonna end it though with this. Faithfulness to our mission will lead to suffering, therefore prepare to suffer. If we're gonna be faithful like Jesus was in 66 through 71, if we're to be faithful to the mission that God has called us to, if he has assigned us positions in the kingdom, rest assured, if Jesus didn't escape suffering, he didn't escape temptation, he didn't escape testing, he didn't escape his own death and suffering, neither will we. What do we need to do today 
to get girded up for that fight along the way. I love you. See you soon. Happy growth groups.